Well, we're going to be looking at Matthew 24 tonight, uh, but by way of introduction, uh, I want us to look quickly at Isaiah chapter 8, uh, Isaiah chapter 8. And um, to give you a context of what's happening in Isaiah chapter 8 is Ahaz is the king of Judah, and he's evaluating the political landscape, and he sees this alliance that is forming between the northern kingdom of Israel, which has given itself over to idolatry, and the nation of Syria to attack Judah. And he's being pressured to join forces with the king of Assyria to fight against the threat of this invasion. And as he is looking at all these things, God speaks to him through the prophet Isaiah. And we read in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11 through 13, it says, For the Lord spoke thus to me, with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And so as Ahaz is listening to CNN and ABC and MSNBC and all the news anchors and all the people that are uh, talking on all of the television shows of his day, the Lord sends a word to him and says, Ahaz, do not listen to the conspiracy theorists. Do not sign their petitions, do not join on their conference calls, do not make alliances with them, and do not let fear control you. Rather, redirect your fear. Put your fear in the right place. Don't be afraid of the governments of this world. Don't buy into the threats of the people. But fear God, because he is the only threat you need to worry about. He will be your sanctuary or he will be your stumbling block. And Isaiah points their attention beyond the earthly, beyond the physical, beyond what they can experience with their five senses, beyond what they can see and hear and feel, and he reminds them that the fate of God's people does not depend on the political landscape of the nation, but it depends upon the faithfulness of God. That was a great opportunity to cheer. Our nation is secure because we're a nation under God. And as long as we remain a nation under God, we have a hope. Pastor Chuck used to say, when I'm going through uncertain times, I do not trade what I know for what I don't know. And it is a fact that we are living in uncertain times. And there's a lot that I don't know about the times that we're in, but I do know this, that God has given us his word and that his word is the sure word of prophecy. And although I don't know what the future will bring, I do know the one who holds the future and he tells me in his word what to expect. And so nothing should take us by surprise. Nothing that we see happening in the world today should be something that makes us think, wow, I didn't see that coming. Because the Lord told us ahead of time what would happen. He said, in the last days, lawlessness will increase. Now, before I go on, I want you to understand that although I'll be using cultural and political references, this is not a political message. Because we're not looking at it through the lens of politics. We're going to be looking at it through the lens of the spirit, through the spirit realm and what is happening in the spirit realm. And often what we see in the natural is a reflection 
of what is happening in the spiritual. You know, take Ezekiel 38 for instance. You know, Ezekiel 38 is poised to happen. All the nations are gathered around Israel, ready to attack Israel. But what brought it all together to the point that it is today is something that happened or began in December of 2010, uh, something that we refer to in history as the Arab Spring. When all of a sudden, in a short period of time, all of the nation, all the governments that were either pro-United States or pro-Israel, all of a sudden became, became anti-Israel. They were replaced by governments that were against the God of Israel. And so when I look at what is happening in the world today, when I look at the political and the cultural upheaval we're seeing in the natural realm, it's a reflection of the battle, the warfare that is happening in the spiritual. And I believe that we've entered into a time that Jesus referred to as the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. In Matthew 24, verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, or I am Messiah, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines, pestilences, COVID-19 and earthquakes in various places and all these are the beginning of sorrows or the beginning, the birth pains. You know, all the ladies know what that means, the birth pains. You know, it's the beginning of sorrows. You know what's going to come. But notice that the first warning is against deception, but I want to look at this warning a little bit different than maybe it's been taught previously, because it can include false teachers. It can include false religions, but Jesus wasn't just talking about religious deception only. He says, many will come in my name saying, I am Messiah, and one thing you have to understand about the Jewish people, and if you go to Israel uh, next year, I pray that you do. We're praying about going, and, and, and we're hoping that we'll be able to go with you guys. Uh, but when you go to Israel, you'll realize that the Jewish people are not looking for a spiritual leader as their Messiah. They're not looking for someone that's going to teach them the Bible. They're looking for a political leader. They're looking for someone that is going to bring peace into the Middle East. They're looking for someone that's going to allow them to rebuild their temple. And so when Jesus says, many will come in my name saying, I am Messiah, they'll say, I'm the one that is going to save the world. I have all the answers that you need. Jesus says, don't be deceived. And he's talking about a broader form of deception, a deception that will affect all people. You know, the the Greek word that's used for deceive means to mislead you to accept a lie as true. It also means to divert you or to keep you from the right course of action, to keep you from knowing what is the right thing to do. And that's what we're experiencing in our nation today. There's a confusion about what is the right course of action, what is the right thing to do to do. When you go to Israel, one of the places you will visit is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And in this last trip that we went with Pastor David, I was blown away by how quickly the people of Germany were brainwashed to the point where they would begin to hate the Jews. And I just looked at the dates. It was astounding to me. In January of 1933, Hitler becomes the chancellor of Germany. And by July of 1933, six months later, the Nazi party became the state party, the only party, and they began to institute the doctrine of racial purity. It was all about racism. In 1935, the Jews were separated.
from the rest of the population. In 1938, synagogues were destroyed. And in 1939, Hitler ordered the systematic killing of the physically or mentally handicapped. Today, we would call them those that have pre-existing conditions. In 1941, Hitler began to systematically kill millions of Jews. It happened in six years. It only took six years for Hitler to change the mind of a nation slowly, slowly, slowly. And he did it without social media or the internet. And I believe had social media been available in that day, it would have happened even faster, as we're seeing in our culture today. And I want you to understand that we are in a season of unparalleled mass deception. Unparalleled mass deception. In previous times, wickedness was hidden below the surface. If a reporter broadcast fake news, said something that wasn't true. It was the end of their career. But now it's out in the open. It's up front. It's in your face. The media, certain leaders are openly misleading and deceiving the American public. On July 23rd, I was shocked to read this headline. It said that studies show that people with psychopathic or narcissistic traits are less likely to follow mask rules. So turn to your neighbor and scoot over another. What's the message? Christians are crazy. They can't be trusted. Every church, every pastor that doesn't wear a mask is a self-centered psychopath. That's the message that is being put out there by the media. There was another headline. Trump's refusal to wear masks is a lack of leadership. And yet many have seen this photo of Biden and Obama, and they're shown wearing masks and talking, and they're walking more than six feet apart. And again, what's the message? That the president is unfit to lead. Another study shows that masks do not protect you, but they dehumanize and they weaken you. Experts show. And what's the message? That the experts can't be trusted because the experts say masks work and then other experts say that masks don't work. So who do you trust? What expert do you trust? And it keeps changing all the time. And this is what I mean by mass deception. There are so many experts and studies being quoted contradicting each other that you become confused and you don't know what the right course of action is. And that is what deception does. It creates confusion and confusion leads to an atmosphere of anger, division, and hatred. That's why you see so much unrest in the nation today. It's mass deception. It's the result of it. Jesus said that Satan has one agenda, to steal, kill, and destroy. So when you see people stealing property, killing people and reputations, destroying, vandalizing, like we've seen on the news, you can be sure that all of this is coming from one place. It's coming from Satan. And what you are seeing in the natural is a reflection of the battle that's happening in the spiritual. In the classic passage on spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul lists four realms of warfare. The first, he says, are principalities. And principalities are, are principal demons, angels over nations and world movements. Like we read in Daniel chapter 10, the prince of Persia that was over the nation of Persia in, in Daniel 10. 
Or as Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, describes the invisible hand of economics as guiding the economies of nations. He's describing a principality. It's unexplained, but they see the effect of it. Then there are powers. And what's interesting about this word power is that it's evil power that works through legal power. Evil power that works through the legal system, through the law. There's a book that is referred to uh, that's called The Naked Communist, and it lays out the 45 goals of the Communist Party. And their stated goal is to infiltrate the legal system and to use law to legalize socialism, to discredit the family, to change the definition of marriage, and to promote homosexuality and provision and, and perversion through legal power, by legalizing it. It's a stated goal. And they've been infiltrating the legal system and introducing bills into Congress that get passed that change the definition of these things in our country. There are rulers of darkness of this world, and that refers to world leaders and social influencers. And I would add to that that it includes social media influencers, those that use social media to influence the masses. The most successful, powerful recruitment tool that ISIS uses is social media. And Satan is referred to as the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2. 2. Then there are spiritual wickedness in high places. And that refers to demonically influenced people who use their influence to intentionally pervert moral values. And these are the ones that we actually allow into our homes without thinking about it. You just need to calm down. Because, baby, you were born that way. And we allow this demonically influence, this demonic influence into our lives. Organizations led by bad people are using social media and media influencers to stage protests and riots. These are the rulers of darkness. They're blatantly anti-American. They're blatantly anti-family. They're blatantly anti-church. They're blatantly anti-Christ. Recently, the social terrorists in Portland burned an American flag, which did you know that before 1969, this was considered illegal? But in 1969, the Supreme Court decided that it's part of your free speech to be able to burn the American flag, and so they made it okay to do that. But along with the American flag, they burned a Bible. Why a Bible? Why not a Koran? Why not the Bhagavad Vita? Why not the writings of Buddha? It's clearly anti God, it's an attack against Christianity. And here's what is troubling to me is that there are actually believers that are participating in these events. There are believers that are marching in these events. In fact, we had a, a protest in San Clemente and there were youth pastors. That parents are trusting their kids to these youth pastors to lead them to Jesus and they're leading them to participate in these events that are organized by evil people. In New York City, Mayor de Blasio is openly quoting Karl Marx in his messages. Spiritual wickedness in high places. If you look up the term Georgia Guidestones, you'll find a monument that was erected by globalists that lists the Ten Commandments of the globalist agenda. And commandment number one says to maintain humanity under 500 billion people in the world. 
It's right out front, their agenda. Commandment seven advocates lawlessness. This is a principality. The Supreme Court of the United States recently redefined the definition of sex to include sexual orientation. So the biblical definition of male and female is no longer the definition in our country. It now is whatever you want it to be. Whatever you declare yourself to be, that's what you are. I've declared myself to be a six-foot, totally buff, stinking wealthy guy like Brennan Beeler. Good looking too. But that's using legal power. It's a form of spiritual battle. It's an area of warfare that, that is happening in our country. The Supreme Court of the United States also rejected to hear two anti-discrimination cases involving churches imposing stricter limitations on churches so that churches cannot meet. Legal power is where the battle is taking place. Did you know that the seven states with the highest death rate in America from the COVID-19 virus, this is all verified on the CDC website, are all led by governors who have imposed guidelines to stop churches from meeting, who are blatantly attacking Christians, including California. And recently, the California governor declared that home Bible studies are illegal. It's clearly anti-Christ. The Antichrist spirit is in our nation. And Jesus said, do not let anyone deceive you. When you see these things, don't be deceived. As Isaiah said, don't buy into this conspiracy theories. Don't listen to the threats. Be aware of what is going on. That there is a spiritual battle that is happening in our nation today. But notice what happens next in verse 9. It says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. They will betray one another, and they will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, because law, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So notice the famines, the pestilences, the earthquakes in verse 7 turn into persecution, betrayal, and lawlessness. And I believe that is where we are today. I believe that is what is happening in our nation today. The Washington Post reported four churches were vandalized. On July 12th, a man drove his minivan into a church while they were holding services, while people were inside. And he set the church on fire with the people inside. The mayor of New York has canceled all large events and health experts say that you should stay home unless you're protesting. Apparently, the COVID-19 is highly intelligent and selective. It doesn't attend protests, but it likes to hang out at church. Maybe it'll get saved. But the point is, is that Christians are being targeted. Churches are being targeted. And persecution is not something that is in the distant future. Persecution is here today. Persecution is in America today, and Christians are being persecuted. And Satan is trying to stop the ministry of Jesus. Just like when Jesus crossed over the Galilee, 
to go over to the Samaritan side of the Galilee, the other side. All of a sudden, at night, a storm comes out of nowhere. And although the area is designed in such a way that those kind of storms happen often, it's rare to have a storm like that happen at night. And what does it point out? It pointed out that whatever was going to happen in Samaria, Samaria, Satan didn't want it to happen. So he did everything he could to stop the ministry of Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He stands up and he rebukes the winds and the waves and they calm down. And he went to the other side. Today, Satan is trying to stop the ministry of Jesus. And if he can discourage you, if he can get you to stay at home and stay in your place and just as a thought your couples dinner that you're going to be having pretty soon and with the singles that are invited I would en- encourage you to wear masks it might increase your odds um, I'm just kidding <laughs> But someone mentioned to me recently, do you realize how all of our women in America now look like they have burkas on? Persecution has come and Satan doesn't like it. But notice the progression of violence here in verse 10. It says, many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. And this is how the enemy is working now in our society. First, you get offended. That word offended means to disbelieve. They lose credibility. You no longer see them as credible. You don't believe them anymore. And maybe you've thought that as you've been around. You said, I can't believe these people. I can't trust these people. They're not wearing a mask. They're standing too close. They're singing in church. They're gathering in groups. I'm offended by them. Or you pick up the offense of someone else, like all the pastors who are apologizing for things that they didn't do. For something they don't understand because someone was offended by their skin color. I grew up in the 60s in the South. And we were part of the group that was force bust as they tried to force segregation. And I lived those turbulent times. I saw it up close. I saw my friends get beat up. I understand what's happening on a level that many don't. And you have all these people that are offended because of what happened to this person or what happened to that person. And we don't have all the information. We don't know all the facts. And we're easily offended. But if you buy into the world rhetoric, if you buy into the world system, then it leads to the next step, and that is, I've got to report them. I've got to do something. And that's what the word betrayal means. It means to surrender them over to an authority. It's the idea of exposing, uncovering, and reporting them to the authorities. California is creating strike teams from 10 government agencies to enforce the governor's guidelines on churches and businesses. I just learned today that L.A. County has now authorized the prosecution of people that do not follow the guidelines that have been issued by the mayor. And their first mission is to go after the people who are outspoken against them. And who does that happen to be? Churches. Calvary Chapel, Thousand Oaks. Pray for them because they're about to be sued by the county. 
on, we have in our neighborhood, the next door website, we have neighbors on this website reporting people and businesses for not wearing masks or socially distancing. And they'll say things like, you know, I, I was at Albertsons and, you know, I was standing next to someone and they didn't have a mask on. Don't go to Albertsons. Let's all boycott Albertsons. And there's so much hatred and so much dislike in their approach to other people. I was driving, when we were driving up here, I, I, I read something where um, a, a lady maced someone that didn't have a mask. Just walked up and maced them. It's incredible, the incredible hatred that is being manifested in our culture. And there's so much hatred in them, it leads them to the final step, step three, where it says, and they will hate one another. Literally what that means is they come to the place where I want nothing to do to, with you. Today it's referred to as the cancel culture. If you offend me, I will do everything in my power to cancel you and to make you disappear. I'm just going to cut you off, have nothing to do with you. It's the practical definition of hate. The word hate literally means to have a strong like, dislike or a, an aversion for. It means I dislike you so much, I want nothing to do with you. I want you to get away from me. And so notice the progression. I'm, re I'm offended, so I'm going to report you, and finally I'm getting rid of you. And Jesus said that the agape love, the love of many, will grow cold. And in just four months, we've seen this happen in our culture. We've seen the love of people for one another to grow incredibly cold where they look at each other as toxic. You can hurt me just by your presence. And people say, wow, this happened so fast. But that's what a birth pang is. That's the definition of a birth pang. It happens suddenly with intensity and it gets faster and more intense as you get closer to the time of birth. We're at the beginning of sorrows. But Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. And he's not talking about salvation here. He's not talking about the kind of salvation, uh, you know, saved like I got saved, you know, at Calvary Chapel. He's talking about safety. He who endures to the end will be saved. He who perseveres, he who refuses to stop, who refuses to join the crowd, he who refuses to go after the things of the world, he who refuses to buy into the conspiracy theories, that, who refuses to listen to the threats, that that person will be saved. The question is, how do we endure to the end? How do we endure? And I believe that in order to defeat, to, do, uh, to defeat the culture, you need to go counterculture. Whatever the culture is doing, you do the exact opposite. The culture says, I'm offended, and I have to act. But we're not to be caught up by their threats. We're not to be reactionary to the propaganda, Christians must be led by the Spirit. We're governed by God. Our lives are submitted to a higher authority. I'm not merely a citizen of the United States. I am a citizen of heaven. I'm not a Democrat. <laughs> I'm 
not a Republican. I'm a monarchist. I have a king. He's the king above all other kings. And as a representative of the king, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and led by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.8, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And like Ahaz in Judah, it would be easy to become overly focused on the events of the day. It would be easy to forget that God does not live in our world. We live in his world. Let me say that again. God does not live in our world. We live in his world. He is the creator of all things. And he is the one that I listen to. Now that doesn't mean that the threats are not real. That doesn't mean that we act unwisely. But what it does mean is that we have a different way of fighting. We have a different way of doing battle. Our weapons are not carnal, they're spiritual. And they pull down strongholds. They set captives free. And that's the battle we should be doing in the power of the Spirit. The Spirit is also symbolized by oil, and oil makes things run smoothly. We've had a, a back door, and um, I'm great with the guitar. I am lousy with a hammer. And uh, for years, I mean probably 10 years, we've lived with our back door, and it doesn't you know, go on its hinges very well, and so I'll pick it up, and I'll move it over, and I'll set it down and get it latched in, and, and we have a bolt that we bolt it down with because the latch doesn't work because it just doesn't work. And one day, my wife's brother was up getting his hair cut, and he goes, I can fix that. And he got some WD-40, and he spent about 10 minutes on the door, and now the thing runs with just your finger. And I felt so stupid. I'm thinking like for 10 years I lived with that and all it needed was a little oil. In these days, we need the oil of the Holy Spirit. So we don't get easily offended. We don't let things rub us the wrong way. We don't let people rub us the wrong way. We can deal graciously with them. And rather than attack the world, let us show the world who God is by allowing the peace that passes all understanding to rule in our hearts and minds, as it says in Philippians 4, 7. Again, I'm not threatened by anything in this world. That's not the thing I'm most afraid of because I fear the Lord. The second thing we must do is we must walk in love. 1 Peter 4.8 says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Jesus said in the last days, people will expose They'll betray, they'll report people to the authorities. But how are we to act as the people of God? Well, the Bible says that love covers. Love protects. Peter says above all things to have persistent, that's what fervent means, it means persistent love for each other, the kind of love that doesn't stop, the kind of love that doesn't give up, but the kind of love that endures. When you're offended, I love you. You get offended again, I love you. You get offended again, don't push me. 
but I love you. It's the kind of love that endures. Listen. The governor is not the enemy. He's just a man. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against Satan and the manipulation that he's putting on people and the way that he is using people to destroy other people. What would happen if the same group of pastors that were suing Newsom would sit down with Newsom? What would happen if they had a conversation? Because you can't preach the good news and be the bad news. And I believe that the church is making the mistake of using the world's tactics. Because the Bible calls us ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors, not warriors. And I think that there are many, like Peter, that pull out their swords. They take swings on Instagram and Facebook. And Jesus looks at them and says, man, just put that thing away before you hurt someone. You're going to stab yourself with that thing. You may remember a bill a few years ago that was being introduced into the California legislature that would ban anything that was considered anti-gay. And the controversy at the time is that they believed at that time that the Bible included hate speech, and therefore it would be on the list of books that was banned by this law. And so a group of pastors decided to meet with the senator that had put this bill together. And when they met with them, they found out that he was a backslidden Christian. And that he was mistreated by the church. That he had a legitimate desire to be free from the things that had captured him and held him in bondage. And when he went to the church, all he found was judgment and condemnation. And he had gotten to the point where he became suicidal. And so as a man, he decided that he was going to introduce a bill that would stop that from happening to anyone else. And that was this bill. And what these pastors did is they showed him the love of God. And they listened to his story. And they began to minister to him as a person. And they said, what what happened to you was not right. That is not how God works. God still wants to set you free. God still has great plans for you. And as a result of showing them the love of God, the senator decided to withdraw the bill. And the bill was never entered into the Senate floor. That is what being ambassador is all about. That's what it means to be an ambassador of Christ. Someone that is willing to go in as a representative of Jesus Christ, bringing the power of the kingdom of heaven to bear on the captivity, the the chains that hold people in bondage, and through the love of Jesus, bring them to the point of freedom. That is what we're to be. Which brings me to the last thing that we're to do. We must preach the gospel. In Matthew 24, 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The gospel must be preached. The governor in California is forcing Christians to go outdoors. Let's not demonize them. Let's use this as an opportunity for God. Jesus is coming soon, and the church has left the building. Finally. 
And people are fighting to get back into their buildings. Fighting for their holy huddles. And the governor is saying, I want you to go out into the, all the world. Duh. Guys, this is our time to shine. This is the time for the church to rise up. This is the time for the church to go and to be light and to be salt in this, gen in this culture because they are hurting They're looking for rest. They're weary. Are you going to seize the moment? Are you going to start praying for opportunities? In our church, we began praying about how we're going to reach families that are doing distance learning. Because if you have kids in your house all day long, you know what you want? A break. What a great opportunity for the church to be a place where parents can come with their kids and have a break around Jesus. Both Christians and non-Christians. Now is the time to walk in the power of the Spirit. Now is the time to be led by the Spirit, to walk in love. This is not a time to hold grudges. This is not a time for bitterness. If you've got bitterness in your life, if you've got unforgiveness in your life, it's time for you to forgive. It's time for you to let it go because there is a work to be done. It's bigger than your offense. Let it go. Forgive and let God use you in these last days. This is the time to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And what I love about Pastor David and what I see in Pastor David is someone who is being led by the Spirit. When everything else was happening, he was here ministering. He never stopped serving this church. He didn't rattle his sword. He didn't go on the internet and call down this person, call out that person. He led by example, by loving people and ministering to people. And that became an example for me. He wasn't signing petitions. He wasn't reacting to threats. And neither should we. But what we should be about is loving the people and demonstrating that God's word can be trusted and his power will prevail in this time. Over the last two weeks, I've been in the Midwest with Mike McIntosh, and we've been doing outreaches and Wisconsin and Illinois and Michigan and Indiana. And we see the hunger that is out there. We see the pain that is out there. We did 17 events in 12 days. At one of the events, there was a husband and a wife that came. The wife loved Jesus. The husband wasn't following Jesus. But he heard the gospel. He came. He didn't respond, but he did pique his curiosity enough to where he went to church the next day, something that they had been praying for for months. And I learned a few days after we had gotten back that he had died suddenly in his sleep. The day of his visitation came, and he didn't respond. The day of visitation has come to the church. God is calling us. Will you respond? Will you be the church? Will you be the ambassador of Christ? at your job, in your place of your neighborhood. It's time to put away childish things. It's time to let the things of the past be the past. 
Because Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? Don't be like this guy that missed the day of his visitation and didn't respond. And maybe tonight you realize you need to let some things go. Maybe tonight, today you realize that I, I, I had someone recently say to me, you know, because the Lord you know, sometimes gives us some great Bible studies and we say some things that are in the scripture and it's very enlightening when it comes to what we're going through. And so they asked me about the future. You know, are we, is my book, should I release my book? Is the economy going to get back? You know, what's my business going to be? And I said, it doesn't matter. None of it matters because Jesus is coming soon. And the only thing that matters now is, is the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom must be preached. And God has placed you, each one of you, right where he needs you to be so that you will be his ambassador. Will you be his ambassador? Will you be that? Will you turn away from the things of this world that don't matter, that have no eternal value, and will you give yourself over to following Jesus? Holy and completely. Jesus is coming soon. Let's pray. Father, I recognize that this is a, a sobering message. As we look at the events of our culture and we recognize that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, host of wickedness in high places, rulers of darkness in this world. And that what we're seeing in the natural is really a reflection of what's happening in the spiritual. Satan knows he has a short time. And he's angry. And he wants to do everything he can to stop the ministry of Jesus. But you are unstoppable. And you have called us to be unstoppable with you. To be your ambassadors. And if you're here tonight and you have been holding back and the Lord is speaking to you and just letting you and just saying, I need, you need to let it go. I want to invite you to stand right where you are. You don't have to come forward, just stand right where you are. And I just want to pray over you. And by standing, you're making a public confession that I am consecrating my life, giving my life wholly and completely to Jesus Christ to be used by him. And I want to invite you to lift your hands to the Lord. And Lord, I pray for these that are standing that have lifted their hands, Lord. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Let the living waters of Jesus, the torrents of living water just flow through them and let it cleanse them from the inside out. Let it break everything off of them that isn't of you. Every chain, every bondage, everything, let it break it all. All of their attachments, everything that they've held on to that isn't you. Unforgiveness, bitterness, let it just be washed away, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit and fill them to overflowing with the love of Jesus. Give them a heart for the lost. Let them see the needs that are around them and empower them to be your hands 
to be your feet, to be your mouthpiece to those that you will bring into their life. In Jesus' name, amen.